Okay, good morning, everybody. We're going to be in Philippians chapter 3, verses 2 through 3. I'll pray for our time together, and then we'll get started. Father, would you please open up your word to us as we study? Would you use it to transform us into the image of your Son? Give us divine wisdom and understanding, Father. Please grant to us your wisdom. We love you. It's in Christ and we pray. Amen. Philippians 3, 2 through 3 says this, Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. So Paul is getting ready to start a conversation here about circumcision and about the works of the law for Jews. And he starts here in verse 2 with this repeated warning. Look out. Look out. Look out. So when we see this repetition, that should instantly catch our attention. Here's the three things we are to look out for. Look out for the dogs, evildoers, those who mutilate the flesh. So there is something in common here. There is some kind of a commonality or something that the author, Paul, wants us to see with this repeated phrase, look out for dogs, look out for evildoers, look out for those who mutilate the flesh. And I want to show you kind of in the Old Testament some scriptures that I think will help us to get some understanding here. Typically, Jews would refer to Gentiles as dogs. But Paul is turning this on its head, and he is using this to describe Jews, and he's not the first one that's done this. If you look in Isaiah 56, verses 10 through 12, you see this. His watchmen are blind. They are all without knowledge. They are all silent dogs. They cannot bark, dreaming, lying down, loving to slumber. The dogs have a mighty appetite. They never have enough. But they are shepherds who have no understanding. They have all turned to their own way, each to his own gain, one and all. Come, they say, let me get wine. Let us fill ourselves with strong drink, and tomorrow will be like this day, great beyond measure. So we've got dogs here. It's got a negative connotation to it. We've got it right here. And it says that they are silent. They cannot bark, kind of reiterating this, dreaming, lying down, slumbering, and they have an appetite, they never have enough. And here it says that they are shepherds. So we're beginning to see now, when he's referring to dogs, he is referring to the Jewish people who are to be shepherds. Their leaders, their religious leaders are to be shepherds, but they are acting like dogs. They are satisfying their own desire. It says that they have no understanding. They've all turned to their own way, each to his own gain, one and all. Come, they say, let us get wine. Let us fill ourselves with strong drink. And tomorrow will be like this day, great beyond measure. So they are driven by their own selfish ambition and vain conceit. And this is exactly what Paul is warning against here in Philippians. He's telling the Philippians to live lives of humility, having the mind of Christ, seeking the good of others above the good of themselves, not just their own interests, but also the interests of others. So here we see that the Jewish people are acting like dogs, though they should be acting like shepherds. They are seeking their own appetite. They never have enough. They are seeking their own gain and seeking to fill themselves with things that they think will make them happy. They're lazy. They're just lying around. We see another phrase here in Psalm 22, 16 through 18. It says here, For dogs encompass me. A company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. 
They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. So this passage should hopefully be a little familiar to you. Even if you were unfamiliar with the Old Testament and with prophecy, it's very easy to see that this is pointing forward to Christ Jesus, his death on the cross, how his bones were not broken, he was nailed to the cross, people were staring and gloating over him, they cast lots for his clothing. Look at who it says surrounds the future Messiah. Dogs. Evildoers. I'm inclined to think that Paul, whenever he was pinning Philippians, and he describes this warning of looking out for dogs and looking out for evildoers, looking out for those who mutilate the flesh, I suspect he had this verse in mind in pinning those words. I suspect that this is what he was thinking about, those enemies that surround the Christ, and they have crucified him, and they have fulfilled the scripture. I think that this is why Paul chooses to use these words here. Look out for the dogs, the ones who crucify the Messiah. Look out for the evildoers, the ones who crucify the Messiah. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. Here, Paul is labeling the Jews as those types of people. They are the dogs and the evildoers. It's those who engage in circumcision, but like it says in Isaiah, they're just dogs seeking their own appetite. Paul says here in verse 3, for we are the circumcision. This is us. And it is not described as those who mutilate the flesh. Rather, the circumcision are described as those who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Paul is going to elaborate on this phrase here. We'll continue to look at that as we continue through Philippians chapter 3. What I want you to see this time is, those who mutilate the flesh, it's talking about these Jews who were convinced that to follow Christ, to profess faith in Christ, is not enough. You must adhere to the Jewish law in order to be saved and redeemed. And part of that Jewish law was circumcision. So Paul condemns this mindset and says, We are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God. This dictates who is of the circumcision and who is not. Circumcision was an outward sign that showed who the people of God were. Whoever was circumcised was a child of God. But then what happened is over time, they thought, as long as I'm circumcised, I'm a child of God, no matter how I live in relation to God. And they mistook circumcision as the absolute identifying factor of whether or not you have a relationship with God. Paul recognizes that circumcision that's done in the flesh doesn't save you. The true circumcision that happens to believers happens on the inside, not the outside. And that is a work that the Spirit of God does within us. So whether or not someone is circumcised, they can say that we are the circumcision. What does that mean? It means that we are those who worship by the Spirit of God. God's Spirit has done a work in us, and we are children of God because of that work. We worship, we glory in Christ Jesus, and we don't put confidence in the flesh. That means we don't put confidence in our ability to uphold the law. We don't put confidence in our ability to attain our own righteousness. Jesus has attained our righteousness, and he gives it to us. Here in 1 Timothy chapter 6, we looked at this passage some time ago. And I want to point back to it to point out something really interesting. If anyone teaches a different doctrine and does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords with godliness, he is puffed up with conceit and understands nothing. 
He has an unhealthy craving for controversy and for quarrels about words, which produce envy, dissension, slander, evil suspicions, and constant friction among people who are depraved in mind and deprived of the truth, imagining that godliness is a means of gain. So it describes someone here who teaches a different doctrine. It says that this person understands nothing. This should instantly ring a bell as we look back here in Isaiah 56. Look here. They have no understanding. Let's keep reading. They have an unhealthy craving for controversy, and it says down here, and constant friction among people. They're depraved in mind, deprived of the truth. This is the phrase I want us to look at. Imagining that godliness is a means of gain. I have a fear that so many of us today, so many Christians today, we live godly lives because there is something in it for us. We serve to gain by our own godliness. We do the things that are good and right because they give a benefit to us. And then whenever that benefit stops, we stop living that life. And this is what it's describing here when it talks about these dogs, evildoers, mutilators of the flesh. They are trusting in their own righteousness. They are putting confidence in the flesh. They believe that by their own good and their own merit that they are going to please God. But what we see here is that the true circumcision does not put confidence in the flesh. Our doing good does not come from a desire to gain, like the dogs, evildoers, and those who mutilate the flesh. We have nothing to gain by what we proclaim and what we do. We are merely servants of God and of Christ who are seeking to live in obedience because of what's been done for us. Here's a strong warning. Look out for those people who are seeking their own selfish ambition. These dogs, evildoers, mutilators of the flesh. Look out for those people who are working and who are doing things that God prescribes, but for their own selfish ambition and vain conceit. This is the warning in Philippians all the way up to this point. Watch out for these people. Don't live like that. Be warned about such people. These are the types of people that crucified the Messiah. And we do not live like that. We have been bought by Christ to be freed from this obligation to uphold the law. And that's good news for us because we could never genuinely do that. So whether or not you have the physical mark of circumcision, it is not this physical mark that God is concerned about. It is the spiritual circumcision in our hearts that is done by the Spirit of God as we come to know Him and he causes us to die to our old selves and to now live for Christ. Let us worship God because of this. Let us glory in Christ Jesus. And let us not trust our own works to get us to heaven. Let us trust the righteousness of Christ. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your scriptures. I thank you for the dire warning here. For the reminder, Father, that we do tend to trust our own works. We do tend to compare ourselves to others and use that as the standard to which we judge our lives to determine if we are really in a right relationship with you. Father, do not let us have confidence in our ability to uphold the law. Don't let us have confidence in our ability to please you by going to church, by being patient, by singing, by tithing, by doing godly things, by helping people. Father, we understand that those things are not requirements. Those things do not guarantee our salvation, but you guarantee our salvation. You guarantee our new birth. And the result of that is that we, as the true circumcision, will live for you because you are our glory and our hope. Father, help us to worship you more truly in our lives in a proper way. 
not seeking selfish gain from our godliness, but seeking to bring you honor and glory. We love you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.